Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of Sin and Tonic. Today's story is that of Stephen Cameron. This was like reading a movie script, not true crime. Let's go. Sin and Tonic! Ha, <sighs> how are we all? Ooh, deep breaths. <sighs> I am filming today in the morning bizarrely it's um the easter holidays here so i couldn't i feel like i've got morning voice mm. anyhow needs must because it's the easter holidays i've got the kids off it's busy and otherwise there would be no video so i'm you know aware that it, it's the morning which is just weird i'm also fresh out the shower so excuse my hair i'm just letting it dry on that trail it's so long now needs a trim needs a trim Today we're off to Swanley in Kent. At the time of our story, Stephen Cameron was 21 years old. He was an electrician, he was a happy chappy, and people around him that knew him, that loved him, they had nothing but lovely things to say about Stephen. He was happy-go-lucky, he was fun, he was very loving and very tactile. He was very close with his family. He lived with his mum and dad and his fiance. so they got engaged in 90, I didn't tell you when what year we're in, did I? Silly me. The time of our case is 1996. Stephen got engaged to Danielle in 1995 at Christmas time, December. Very romantic. And life was sort of shaping itself up a bit here because they were they got engaged at Christmas and then they were going to move out. So move out of his mum and dad's and move in with Stephen's best friend. So they were all going to live together. Things were moving onwards and upwards for Stephen. That was until Sunday the 19th of May in 1996. Stephen and Daniel woke up that morning, like any other morning, and they decided on a plan for their day. Stephen had been drinking the night before, so he wanted Danielle to drive because they had planned to go into London to buy some food, some shopping, and go and meet some friends. So because he was probably questionable, probably over the limit still, he asked Danielle if she would drive. This was knowing now what it's like, because I, I, when did I pass? A year and a half ago now. Whoa, time flies. Anyway, I didn't learn to drive until I was 34. Was it? I'm 36. Yeah, about 34. So I think when you're a bit older, you have more fear, because oh, when when going to London would have meant going on a motorway, and it would have meant driving a van because they had a van what now daniel was 17 so she was very very young and new to driving however i don't think you have that same fear like when i learned to drive at 34 like i've had kids i'm so scared of the world like things happen to you in your life and you get to like in your 30s and you're just like well everything is scary everything is scary terrifying all sorts of things can happen no thank you driving a metal thing mm -mm. scary I was scared I think that's normal when you get to that age to be cautious when you're driving when you're 17 probably not so much you're fearless aren't you but I was fearless at 17 and you're just out there mm -mm -mm. nothing can hurt you you know great in some ways because that's when you take your chances in life why am I talking about this Anyway, the psychology of 17-year-olds and driving with safe. Anyhow, so they woke up and he said, you know, fancy driving the van, fancy going on a motorway. And she was like, no, I'm okay. She was a bit nervous about it, but she did do it. However, due to her inexperience, I believe, at some point when they were on their journey, Danielle cut somebody up. Now, this does, again, having learned, this does happen when you are new to driving because you don't know, you, you judge things incorrectly. And, and that is what happened. And she cut somebody up, carried along on the journey. And shortly after this, they came to some traffic lights. And this Land Rover Discovery pulled up, screeched past and stopped in front of her car. So she couldn't go anywhere. And then the driver got out. And that is terrifying. That is road rage at a new level when somebody has stopped got out and they are approaching you in your car or van my heart would be like 100 beats a minute the driver was furious and this guy was screaming shouting very angry as he approached their van 
This ended up becoming a physical fight between this man and Stephen because Stephen had got out of the van and gone to talk to this very angry man. Danielle was witness to the whole event and she said that the the man, who was older than Stephen, he was the person that, that, that threw, that threw the first punch, say that fast, and Stephen then had to defend himself and then they got into a physical fist fight. But Stephen was a lot younger than this man. So he ended up, there was no sort of like victorious like winner, like in a boxing match, but he got the better of this man. That is when this man, I've said this man so much it sounds weird, this fella strolls back to his Land Rover that is parked in front of their van, they can't go anywhere. Stephen is walking back towards his van And the guy returns with a knife. Poor Danielle, because she could just see all of this unfolding, but it was too late to really have any effect and warn Stephen. The man then stabbed Stephen twice, once in the heart and once in the liver. The guy then gets back into his Land Rover and drives off. He's out of there. He has started a fight and stabbed Stephen twice, once in the heart as well, like, come on, man and then driven away. Danielle went straight to Stephen. She was holding Stephen in her arms. She called 999, and then she called Stephen's dad. Paramedics arrived at the scene, but it was too late, and sadly, Stephen passed away. His final words to Danielle were for her to get the the license plate of the Land Rover before he drove off. That is clever thinking. That That is true crime thinking, isn't it? In his last moments, he was like, we need to catch that man. Sadly, nobody actually managed to get the number plate. Don't blame them. That is such a highly stressful situation. I always wonder that, you know, when people manage to, people do manage in really crazy situations to remember so much or to get number plates and things like that. And it's like, wow, because it must be so stressful in those moments. And I think for Danielle, she was focused on Stephen, but yeah, but no one got the whole number plate but it was an L. Reg Land Rover. They knew that much. No forensic evidence. And despite many witnesses, because people were driving past the other way, it was busy, people were driving past. So there were lots of people that saw the altercation and saw different stages of the fight and the, the whole thing. Sadly, because of just a lack of evidence, there was no CCTV, oh, just, and there was no like, dash cams and stuff. We're in 1996. The case just started to go cold. Little did everybody know that Stephen's killer was actually a notorious career criminal. Danielle had given a description of the man and the scene and she'd been really helpful and she had given, you know, as much as she could to the officers. But the break would come when intelligence came into the police that a criminal in the area was missing. Mm. So I think when there's like a murder inquiry or something that's happened like this, police informants and stuff, they they talk to people about, the, you know, known cr- cr- criminals, criminals, criminals in the area. And part of that brought up that this guy was missing. He had disappeared 24 hours after Stephen had been killed. Ooh, uh, this guy was called Kenny Noy, and he has quite the story. His house was searched. Everything was searched. His car was missing. And guess what he drove? A Land Rover Discovery. Come on. And also he was nowhere to be seen. He had just literally disappeared off the face of the planet. And that was unusual for him. He was not one to shy away from things or to just up and go. No, but he was gone. He had vanished. Kenny Noy has quite the story. Born in May 1947, Kenny Noy had been an accomplice in money laundering from a very like, I think it was the biggest robbery, largest robbery of gold bullion in British history. It was called the Brinks Matt Robbery. It happened on the 26th of November in 1983. Six robbers broke into the Brinks Matt unit. Sorry, this is all hard to say. This was on a trading estate near Heathrow Airport in the UK. One of the security guards was, you know, being naughty. So it was like an inside job. He got them in. When they were inside, they poured petrol over the people that were there, working there, and they threatened to set them on fire if they didn't give them the codes to the safe and things like that, like the vault. 
crazy, isn't it? This is literally... In fact, they have made a film about this. Oh, what's it called? The Gold something. I'll, I'll share it. The robbers thought they were going to steal about a million pounds worth of money. However, when they opened the vault, they found three tonnes of gold bullion. What's this? It was just being stored at that warehouse overnight before it got shipped off somewhere to like Hong Kong or something. So it was just there by chance. Three tonnes. And they ended up stealing the equivalent today of £26 million. Pounds. What? I know that this is criminal and naughty, but that is the equivalent of finding... Well, no, it's not. I can't think. You know, like when people find a fiver in their pocket and you're like, oh, sweet. This was like that on steroids. I found 20 quid the other day down that had fallen down the side. I was like, sweet, sweet. I didn't go much further into Noy's past. However, Noy was not one of the robbers. He was recruited by one of the people involved to manhandle and sort of, you know, he was fraud. So he he was an expert in this. So he'd obviously he was in that circle, criminal circle. And he melted down the gold and things like that and mixed it with other stuff and just you know, I don't think a lot of this gold was ever found. Can you believe? So Noy got the gold, he he mixed it with another metal to disguise the um, you know, the 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 heritage of the gold, basically, and then it was sold on. Whoa. Whoa. Things came to light and the police were made aware that Noy was part of this operation. They found out, you know, through intelligence and the investigation. So he was placed under surveillance and an undercover police officer went to Noy's house, his property. He was on his grounds and Noy found him and he stabbed him 10 times. I believe it was 10 times. And he killed this undercover police officer. Now, this all went to trial. He was arrested. This was in 1985. And and he was, he was acquitted because it was believed to have been self-defence. However, he was sentenced to 14 years for his part in the gold and the fraud and all of that. So, you know, he, he was behind bars. He was released seven years later. So he served half of his sentence and he had only been out of prison for, it wasn't very long. He was released in 1995 and then Stephen's murder was in 1996. Isn't it always the way, I suppose, with everything? But like, if he'd have just been released at a slightly different time, this wouldn't have happened. And yeah, there, there must be so many what ifs for family and friends when somebody is murdered, because, you know, what if he'd have served another six months and he would have been in prison or, you know, what are the chances that he met him, that it was him that they cut up? It, I just can't get over that. In 1998, two years after Stephen was murdered, there was a break in the case. There was a sighting of Noy in Spain. Two undercover police officers were sent out to Spain to verify the identity of this man that people were saying was Noy. Dangerous game because he's already killed a police officer. Although he said that was in self-defence and it was on his property, so very different. But, you know, and he has also stabbed somebody to death with road rage, so he is a dangerous person. They were brave, but so was Danielle, because then they flew Danielle out to Spain because she was the only person that could identify Noy as the person that had killed Stephen, hopefully. You know, they were hoping this was their man. And it was when she got out to Spain, obviously she was with police officers. She He was in a restaurant and she identified him as the person that stabbed Stephen. Within 24 hours, all the police forces do what they do, communicate, because there's all, you know, it's got to be all official. And the Spanish police arrested Noy and then the process of extra, extradition, is that a word? Made that up they extradited him back to the UK. However, that process took a whole year. So they had him in Spain a whole year. He pleaded not guilty. And at first for a time, he just said he had nothing to do with this. He wasn't there. It wasn't him. He said that the police were trying to pin this on him because he had killed a police officer and he'd gotten away with it. And he thought that they just wanted to get him for anything. However, he soon changed his tune. He had to admit that he was there and he said it was self-defence. He likes that number, doesn't he? Self-defence. So that's what he said. Self-defence, Your Honour. And, you know, Stephen didn't have a weapon. 
he said he was trying to protect himself, but that that didn't work because it wasn't in the heat of the moment. He didn't just have a knife in his hand. He went back to his vehicle to get a knife and Stephen was leaving. He was walking away. So, yeah, he was found guilty of Stephen's murder. Danielle was a key witness. She had seen the whole thing. She was up close and personal to this and she had seen his face and she identified him as Stephen's killer. Because of Noy's criminal background and the circles that he would have been in, Danielle was then put into witness protection, which makes sense to me because you just don't know, you know, that robbery of the gold was like, I think it was known as like the crime of the century or something. Like it was a big deal. So, you know, he was in that circle of people as well for a time. So who knows who he knows and what he can, you know, get sorted out, if you know what I mean. So she went into police witness protection, which meant a double loss, really, for Stephen's family. Because after the trial, they never, ever saw Danielle again. So she was given a, given a new name, a new identity. She was moved. And they were very close with Danielle. And also that must have been really difficult for Danielle because when you're grieving and you've lost somebody, part of that process, you know, is being around all of the other people that loved that person as well. So I feel like that made it a very lonely grieving process for Danielle and a, and another loss for Stephen's family because they were so close to her and they really looked after her and they, they loved her. So, yeah, very, very sad. Noy was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 16 years. Stephen's mum was quite disappointed in that. She was happy that there was justice and they'd caught the person that had killed her son. But she wanted life to be life. And she found it difficult that it was, you know, 16 years. And Noy was released in 2019. And it's believed that he's living somewhere in Kent there are two sort of like little side stories to this case. I went down a proper rabbit hole with this one. I was like, what is there? What is there? What? There was so much to it. At the trial, there was another witness that was crucial to putting Noy behind bars, basically. Let me read his name because it's tricky. I think Mr. Decabral. Deca Decabral? Sorry if that's not right. He was another witness and he saw. Noy actually stab Stephen. So he was, you know, key witness here. He too was offered witness protection, same reason as Danielle. However, he turned that down despite having had death threats. He said that he'd had bullets put through his front door. So yeah, he didn't take the witness protection. I mean, you've got to go away and start a completely new life. And that's quite a big deal, isn't it? So I think that's, it's not a very, it's, that's tricky. However, he turned it down. A couple of months after the trial, he was sat in a car park in the passenger seat of his son's car and he was shot in the head by a hitman. What? What did I say? This was like reading a movie script. Like, what? But it is not that straightforward because you're like, oh yeah, I was the same. Oh, that's something to do with, you know, Noi being put in prison. Surely. Hmm. Questionable. Lots of people that knew of Mr. Decker Brow, sorry, I don't know how to say it, it's annoying, I hate it when I don't know. They would say that he was he was also mixed up in criminal circles, people people described him as a shady character. Even Noy at the his trial, he contested that that he was a witness because he said, you know, he's not trustworthy, etc. And yeah, but it would seem that Mr. Freck, Mr. D was embroiled with some qu other questionable characters. So there, and and it was thought that there were a number of different people that would have wanted to see him dead, not just the fact that he put Noy in prison. So that was not black and white, not at all. That's very grey. Also, at the time, Noy was in what's that thing oh my gosh you know like almost like solitary confinement and stuff so it was like near on impossible for him to have ordered a hit on someone oh, I can't believe I said that it's it, it's such a bizarre case to me it's so bizarre because in my head gangsters things like that you know I think of um like you know 
American movies, like in America, like gangsters and stuff and gangs. But it does happen here. Like these things, like, you know, it, it is real. It's true. I'm going to give you to the count of 10 to get your ugly, yellow, good one on piece of my property before I pump your guts full of lead. <sighs> you catch my drift. But no, here we are in a real life UK gangster movie. And then, because I was thinking, you know, Noi has got to have, excuse me, this is what happens when you film in the day. Can you hear that? Mmm. I'll be patient. What are you doing with your home improvements, man? <laughs> Noi must have had some money, mustn't he? Must have had a bit of that. You know, his part in that gold stuff that makes me think of parks and rec like he'd he'd hidden his gold somewhere you know ron swanson if you know you know anyway so i'm thinking you know he he must have had a bit of money and also after killing stephen he just was out of the country turns out he had used his connections in in the criminal world underworld underbelly of the beast to get out of the country unnoticed he got a fake passport he was known as something else I want to say Marty something, Martin something, can't remember. Anyway, he was gone into in Spain where he owned a very luxurious villa. So, you know, he'd, he'd used a bit of the old gold bullion and with cash had bought himself this villa under a fake, false name. So it's all very, you know, this is mad, isn't it? This is mad. So he goes over to Spain. And that's where he was for two years. He was just living in Spain, drinking, eating in bars, known as something else, luxury villa. What? He was renting that villa out at some point recently via Airbnb under the name of his son. But this all got found out because of the press, I think. Here we go. More home improvements. Oh, no, thank you. Anyway. Oh, oh, it's very quiet. We'll carry on. Oh, oh, oh. oh. Thank you. Turns out that he was making a, 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 a nice chunk of money from renting this out for holidays. It's like two grand a week or something. Whoa, it's like a luxury. I'll share some pictures. Luxury villa, right? So it was on Airbnb. Somehow it got caught wind that it was his and it's suddenly not available on Airbnb anymore. But it's still rented out over in Spain. And I think he's trying to sell it. I think now he's just like, oh. And I think he's selling it for like 1.7 million or something. What? Mad. Now, the police believe that this villa was bought with proceeds from, you know, the Bricks Mat robbery. Now, I thought that if you find out or if there's proof that this, you know, you know, I thought they could seize the property or, you know, whatever. But no, apparently no. Let me read what it says. So they're unable, they were unable to seize the property under the Proceeds of Crime Act because it was outside of their juris jurisdiction. So does that mean if you are a criminal, criminal, if you're a criminal and you get yourself out of the country, go to another country and buy stuff there, buy property, whatever, because it's no, no longer in the UK, they can't seize it? What? Now I know why so many of these, you know, criminals, the underbelly of the beast, why they all go out to Spain. Now I get it. It's like a little safe haven for them. Spend their money. But boom. What? Mad. Mad. So he's going to get like 1.7 mil and there's nothing they can do about it. And, and yeah, why is he in Kent? Get yourself over to Spain, mate. Sonny. Got, you've got to, why not live in it what's occurring there what is occurring there maybe he's on license and he can't go to spain maybe while i found the whole case fascinating and like what is this like this you know it was quite a journey doing the research and just like what 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 however let's not forget that that the the crux of it the whole the whole case that i'm covering even though i have talked about other elements of, of it was the murder of Stephen Cameron, which is very tragic, very sad. Such, 
you know, sometimes I have like these, I have, I get really angry about something or my overriding feeling in this case when I was researching was just talk about wrong place, wrong time, but the timing of everything that led up to that. Oh, I just, I couldn't get over that. I couldn't even get over the fact that they left at that time. It was 1.20 in the afternoon on Sunday, 1.20 p.m. What? Just gone to go and get some shopping, go meet some friends. I know that a lot of cases are like that. It's like, you know, none of them make sense. But with this one, I just, I couldn't get over it. I was like, yeah, mad, absolutely mad. And so, so tragic that that happened. And I, I just, I had so many what if, like what if he hadn't have gotten out of the the vehicle? What if Kenny had chosen to stab him somewhere different and not in the heart? You know, that's such a, that's such a, that that gets me as well because it's so, um, what's that? You know, his anger, that, that, that went to another level and he, he went for somewhere that he, you know, that's probably going to kill somebody, isn't it? What if Danielle had been like, actually, no, I'm too scared to drive. Just I, all of these things came up when I was, you know, researching this case. Yeah, I, I just feel, I just felt, it felt so, I don't know, maybe because it just felt so unnecessary for that to happen and for, for him to lose his life. And that is all I have for you on today's case. Let me know what you think about this one in the comments. I'm not going to sit and chat too long because, you know, someone's building a, a house, sounds like. But yeah, we're in our Easter holiday now. So the kids are off. I think in America it's spring break. Is this spring break? That sounds nicer. But anyway, we're in the Easter holidays and two weeks off with the boys. Lots of chocolate. Yes, please have a good one whatever you do oh every time I'm ending a video this wrist or well whatever one of them just always has to have a click so come on clickety click let me know what your plans are for Easter we've got three Easter egg hunts that we're doing so they are literally going to be up to their eyeballs in chocolate fun I do love chocolate but right now I could murder a hot cross bun literally love I, I do like a hot cross bun I like a fancy hot cross bun with um m and do amazing hot cross buns with all different types of things in yes that see that's all I fancy with loads of butter I'm gonna love you and leave you before somebody starts you know drilling or hammering again this is what happens when you film in the daytime Sophie but anyway don't be cross about it people have got to live their lives people have got to make videos what are you gonna do live in harmony okay Right, love you. Have a wonderful Easter. Fill me in with your plans. Let me know what you think about the case. Any case suggestions, please put them in the comments because I love having case suggestions to look into. And I will see you all next week. Bye.